Now, have you ever been in the wrong place at the wrong time? Many times I've been in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I heard this week uh, of a missing, or should I say missing, man in Turkey who ended up joining the search party for himself. So Mr. Mutlu had been drinking with his friends when he wandered into the forest. And when he didn't come home, his wife was incredibly worried and, and called the police and they sent out a search party for him. Now, Mr. Mutlu had seen a bunch of people walking around and he thought he'd go over to see what was happening and someone must have said to him, this is a search party. And being the good man he was, he thought, I'm gonna join this search party <laughs> and help find whoever is missing. But after not too long, they started calling out his name, to which he said, here I am, why is everybody calling out my name? Um, to which they were obviously incredibly confused, and uh, I'm sure when he got home, he was not in his wife's good books. <laughs> but the truth is, you are in the right place at the right time today. Each of us here today are in the right place at the right time. It's no accident that you are here today. You're here for a purpose this morning, and you're part of a bigger story. You and I and this We Church community that we're building together is part of God's bigger story, and everyone has a part to play in this. And so we're continuing in our current series this morning called Pictures of the Church, where we see God's heart for church shining through. That church is to be an utterly life-changing community to be part of. And today, as Abby shared with us just a moment ago, we're going to be looking at the church being a picture of the temple. So we're in Ephesians chapter 2 today, verses 19 to 22, and the, the verses will come up on screen. But just before we read that, I'll give you a quick bit of context. So uh, having once been dead in our sins, Paul makes it really clear in this passage that we've moved from death to life because of Jesus, that he has made us alive in him. And this is all by his grace. And because of that, we now have a purpose in him. And it's not just for the end of our life but it's for now. In verse 10, it says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do we know that we are God's handiwork? That God does not do mass production. He does handcrafted. And each of us are handcrafted by the Lord and he loves us, and he saved us for a purpose. And in these verses, running up to the ones we're about to read, Paul speaks about a divide that is now gone. That there were those who were being excluded from receiving God's promises because they were seen as being outside of God's people. But it's being made clear that because of the work of Jesus on the cross, he has removed the divide between who's in or who's out based on race or background, and all are invited to come to Jesus. So that's where we pick up in verse 19. I can feel a bit of a breeze. Is anyone cold? Are people okay? If anyone does feel cold, just feel free to pull that too. Uh, so from verse 19, uh, are we ready to, to get that up on screen? Thank you very much, Colin. Brilliant. Thank you so much. So consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. 
how amazing these verses. It gives us a bird's eye view, a picture of God's heart for his people to come together and to be carriers of his Holy Spirit. And I see three moves in these verses. A move from being a stranger to a citizen, a move from rubble to restoration, and a move from desolation to dwelling. And so we'll start with a move from being a stranger to a citizen. Now, I moved to Scotland in September 2019 as an Englishman from London, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent. And uh, I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't sure whether I'd be the only English person in the halls of residence that I'd be staying. I wasn't sure whether I'd be taking the mick out of because of my accent or whether I'd be incredibly welcome. Of course, I was very, very welcome straight away. And we've been here for 12 years. Or I've been here for 12 years since, and this has become my home. And when I first moved, there was one guy in my flat who had a very strong Scottish accent. He was from Hoik. When I saw it written, I was like, from Howick? Like, that's, uh, I've never heard of that before, but it's Hoik. And uh, he kept on saying, Ken, Ken this, Ken this, Ken that. I had no idea who this Ken was, what he was talking about until I realized, um, as I'm sure you all know, Ken means no. And so it was, a, it was a bit of a learning curve for me, but I felt like a stranger to start with, and very quickly I was made to feel very much at home. And in these verses, there is a move from being a foreigner and a stranger to being a citizen of God's people. A citizen is someone who has full rights, who has full access and permission to belong in that place. I think... Uh, we might all be British citizens in this, in this building here today, and uh, we'll know that it's a, there's so many people who strive for that citizenship. I knew a couple uh, recently, two twin sisters who were wanting to become citizens, and it was a, a long battle, lots of paperwork, finances, applications, and, and they managed to get granted citizenship here. But a citizen is someone who has that right to belong and that full access and those privileges and in Paul saying that you are a citizen of God's people it means that each of us belong here that you have full access to God and all his promises that all his benefits are yours in Christ and the good news is that that begins now this isn't just something for the end of our life, but it's something that starts now. Jesus, in his first recorded preach in Luke chapter 4, said that the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That is the work that God is doing in us right here and right now. And gaining our citizenship cost Jesus absolutely everything. It cost him everything on the cross in dying for us and rising again for us. We don't have to go through lengthy application processes with God. We don't have to be vetted. We don't have to in, invest our finances to gain the freedom that he is giving us. It is a total free gift from the heart of God that gives you full access to the Father, full inheritance in the Holy Spirit. And it's something that begins now and gets sweeter all the way till we see Jesus face to face. And there's no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. God doesn't take into account our age, whether we're the oldest or the youngest in this room, our employment status, our financial standing, anything like that. When he calls us to be his children, to follow him together, it's because of Jesus and in him and the work he has done that we become citizens of God. 
In God's kingdom, because of Jesus' work on the cross, there are no levels of privilege, no best seats in church, no special treatment for certain people. We're all one in Jesus. Together, we are citizens of God's kingdom together. And isn't that wonderful? That when we're saved by Jesus, there's a personal difference, yes, but also he invests us into a community, into the body of Jesus, the church, this picture of the temple that we're seeing this morning, that we come together. And the application for us this morning of us being citizens is that church is a place for each of us to belong and be. It's a place to be known. It's a place to experience the welcome of God and the welcome of others in this life-changing relationship with Jesus. So then secondly, there's a move from rubble to restoration. Does anybody watch Grand Designs on telly sometimes? Yeah, me and Abby love watching Grand Designs. We've watched, I think, pretty much all of them, from the oldest right up to the newest episodes. And there's so many different buildings there that have been restored from an old cinema to there was a water tower we saw restored to barns and collapsing old buildings that have been rebuilt, restored, and turned into the most incredible homes. And in speaking about what, has, what God has done, bringing people who were once far off from him together in him. In verse 21, it says, in him, the whole building, that's us, is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. That is incredible. The context of the temple is that the temple in the Bible had incredible significance. And uh, it had what Jesus called, or what Paul called, it was a shadow of what was to come, that there was greater things to come. And the root of the temple goes right back to Exodus and the tent of meeting and the tabernacle. And this was important, not because of the structure of what it was, but because of what it was pointing to. This was a place where God's presence on earth was found. God's presence so holy that few could enter that space at that time. And this whole tent would be moved depending on where God led his people through the desert to the promised land. And then the building of the temple became a great focus of God's people as a permanent place for God's presence and meeting with his people. But then when Jesus came, he made it clear that the true meaning of the temple was beyond the bricks and the mortar. It was not, the significance was not in the building and in and of itself. It was pointing to something far greater. It was just a shadow of the magnificence of what was about to come. In fact, Jesus, uh, before he died, he pointed to the temple as something which was actually going to be destroyed and rebuilt in just three days. And people were absolutely outraged by that. They could not believe he would say such a thing about such a sacred space. They could not believe it. They said, how could he rebuild this in just three days when it took so many years to build? And then when Jesus died, it says that the temple curtain that divided the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was, from everyone else, was torn in two, showing that we now have full access to God. It was, not just this, it was no longer going to be the select few who could have access to God's presence, but all could have access to God through Jesus. Now in Jesus, from the rubble and the mess of our sin, he invites us to come and he builds us together into his holy temple with him as the cornerstone holding all things together. He's not talking about a building or even a place you go like this sports hall to meet with God. He's talking about each of us living stones, cracked 
and broken, yet so deeply loved by him, and then forming us into his temple. It's the people. Have you seen maybe St. Paul's Cathedral or Westminster Abbey? Uh, Maybe you've had the fortune of even being in the Sistine Chapel or somewhere like that. The buildings of incredible beauty. Have you seen an old church building, been inside, and just felt this sense of awe and wonder at the grandeur of the place? Well, this is just a shadow of what Jesus' vision of his church would be. Coming together for his glory in our brokenness, in our mess, but him bringing us together and uniting us together for his glory. And the truth is, this means that our relationships matter. Our relationships really do matter. How we respect and honor one another, how we love one another, how we forgive one another, how we relate to each other, because it's in our midst that the Holy Spirit dwells. The Holy Spirit dwells in each one of us, But as we come together as his church, the body, the Holy Spirit dwells in between us, in our relationships, in amongst us. That's so important how we relate to each other. And this takes us on to the third move in this passage. In verse 22, and that's from from desolation to dwelling place. So in verse 22, we read, and in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. Then in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, it says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Holy Spirit dwells in your midst? This is something that cannot happen alone. What he's talking about cannot happen as an isolated believer. There's something about coming together as the body where God works in a really, really special way. And his vision is that as Christians come together in his body, the church, that we become this holy holy temple where he dwells by his spirit. How incredible. It's no wonder that Jesus really cherishes the church And it's described even as his bride. Because together, in our relationships, as we come together, God lives with us. That's the church. That's us in this building this morning. The people of God with the Holy Spirit dwelling among us. In God's kingdom, there's no second-class citizen. Because of Jesus' work on the cross, we're all citizens in him. He calls us to come together, to build together this temple that is the church. But it's not a building, it's not a place, it's his people. And as we come together, that's a door shut. (laughs) He dwells amongst us by his Holy Spirit. Why don't we stand and let's respond.